Welcome back, everybody. John Arvosis here with uh, Cliff Schechter and Thomas Zimmer. <laughs> um, well, hello. Thomas, yep, hey, Cliff. Uh, Thomas is a professor at Georgetown School of Foreign Service, my alma mater as well. And his expertise is uh, American history, recent American history since the 1960s. But as I like to say, it, his expertise is also, um, I would say, extremism. I, I, we had a very long talk over lunch, and I think he's got an amazing background in sort of extremism worldwide. Uh, when I say extremism, I mean sort of governments and, and governments moving towards fascism, things like this back and forth. Um, American history as well. You know, He schooled me on the Reconstruction after the Civil War. Um, so I assume he and Cliff will just kind of talk about history and turn into butter um that's right we're gonna have fun and john's gonna be like we're gonna, john, john will get lost and um, exactly but i'd like to start by asking you what would make you interested in authoritarianism when you come from a country that has never had any in the past <laughs> sorry i couldn't help myself so, Let's go. so I'm thomas, german. thomas is german and cliff I'm is german. making a german joke yes <laughs> i can't help it yes i mean I no, apologize. there are many germans who um who like to think that our actual proper history started in 1945 so you know they would <laughs> they would maybe agree with with your take there but no i mean look um to be honest i get that question quite a lot like what's is it a specifically german interest or a specifically hmm. german sort of you know, uh, sensibility for not anymore. No, I mean, no, it's American but, too. <laughs> but is it is sort of your the question I get a lot is is your why you went into it? Yes, is right. your interest in American democracy right and in the current American political situation is has that to do with your being German and right. sort of Germany's Germany's uh let's say experience with right. <laughs> anti democratic uh, uh, um, forces and movements and and my answer to that is maybe um maybe there's certain <clears throat> i guess there's certain you could say uh sort of pro democratic sensibilities that um the german the german educational system and the german political culture is is very sort of um uh, blatantly and actively pro democratic right, right. Um, yep. and, um there is a certain sense in which some of the discussions over here over like you know how to deal with anti-democratic uh forces anti-democratic political movements right. um and and sort of what level to what level of leeway to give them right sounds a little weird to a german in the sense that german democracy after 1945 was explicitly built on the idea that democracy has to be um, there was the idea of militant, they called it militant democracy, right? Hmm. Which means democracy has to be strong enough to defend itself against hmm. those who want to get rid of it. Hmm. Um, and that means um, the sort of setting certain boundaries. And if you cross those boundaries, we're no longer going to accept you. We're no longer going to accept your right to whatever, like free speech or, or whatever, right? So uh -huh. I think that's a, that's a distinct difference between sort of the German... Well, Political system. I have to say something going. here, John, just yeah. because as John knows, you know, this has been sort of close to a, a white whale obsession of mine. And I talk about this on the show a lot, which is, you know, and again, I'd love to hear more from you because you know so much more, I'm sure, about Germany and various European systems. But like we can free speech ourselves to death. And I talk about that a lot, which is, oh, everybody has the right to say anything and do anything. And it was one <clears> thing when it was a guy standing on a street corner screaming and yelling. Now we're talking about people that have access to millions, billions via Facebook. And and so right. that's when my criticism here of Fox News. I mean, I, I, let's get to the point, which is the other day, Ted Cruz defended somebody's right to give oh. a Nazi salute at one of these school board meetings. Yeah. Why don't you tell folks what would have happened in Germany if somebody had done that? And I'm going to pre-endorse. Or is it legal? I'm going to, hold on. Yeah. I'm going to pre-endorse what Germany would have done because to me, we are not protecting, we're allowing free speech to override misinformation and hate speech in this country. I'll kick it to you. Right. So um, like it's it's just downright illegal. Right. So the, the display, the open, dis the public display of Nazi, Nazi insignia is is illegal. Right. Hmm. So you got, even you doing the salute. To, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, oh, wow. Yeah. So the, the swastika, okay. the Nazi salute. Right. Um, it's it's illegal. You will get and it's enforced. So hmm. you will get into legal trouble. Right. This what is what kind of trouble would you get? Is it just a fine? What is it? Yes. Yes. So initially you would get fined, right? But if hmm. you keep doing it, there you might you might go to jail over wow. this, right? 
Um, so this is a we take this seriously, right? So yeah. this is enforced. Yep. This is not one of those. Oh, it's illegal on paper, but no one cares. No, no, no. people care, right? People right. care. Um, so I guess that is one of the differences, right? That's that's what I mean when I when I say so. The idea was we need to set certain boundaries. We need to guardrails have, around right? democracy. Right, certain guardrails, um, and that are sort of enforceable, right? Um, and I think the, the big difference in 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 sort of the German political culture is that all German sort of pro-democracy parties, or I call them like democratic parties with a small d, like all German small d mm -hmm. democratic parties um, are very clear that they're going to hold the line against what we call far-right extremism. Right. We have a far-right party now um, that is in the German parliament. So it, it's called the AFD, right? They call it the Alternative for Germany. Um, it's 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 a far-right party. Um, it it polls at around 10 to 15 percent. Um, it, it it got in the in the general election that we just had just a few weeks ago. It just it, it got something like 10 or 11 percent of of the vote. So it, it is in parliament, right? But that's the big difference. All the other all the other uh, democratic parties, small d democratic parties, um, have so far held the line, right, and have clearly said we are not going to collaborate with the far right party in in any way right in any way not right. on the federal level not in the states and the big difference to the us situation of course is that um the the, the far right sort of forces and factions um are now dominating what is supposed to be the quote unquote conservative party right, right. um so whereas in germany you have the conservative party which like is the angela merkel cdu right the christian right. democrats center right kind of party it's a center-right kind of party. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's it's a broad sort of big tent party. Uh, the, the, the Merkel wing of the CDU would clearly be Democratic Party over here, right? The sort of oh, right wing, uh, conservative right. wing right. of the CDU would be probably Republican Party, but... But the moderate wing, the quote unquote mm. moderate oh, that's wing funny. of the Republican Party, right? <laughs> it's that small of a segment we, we would represent in European politics. We call that a big tent party, all right? Um, <laughs> right. Um, whereas the mm. AFD, so what we call the far right party, right. right, is is just that is just basically in many ways what has become the mainstream position in today's Republican Party, right? right. And that is really, really concerning right. because again, as a historian. Like if you want to learn, quote unquote, learn anything from history, I think one thing we can really learn is that far right parties, far right movements, they never get to power by getting a right majority of the vote, right? That's not how any sort of fascist, far right nationalist, whatever you want to call it, uh, a party uh, got to power in like Europe's 1930s interwar right. period. That's not what happened. Right. Hitler what never happened? got more than 30 something percent of the vote. Right. So the, the, the Nazi party in Germany peaked at like 37 percent. Um, right. But um, what happens is or what happened was that the center right party, the conservative parties decided to make common cause with the far right parties for a variety of reasons. The main reason being that they said, well, you know, there's a threat of leftist extremism, communism, whatever they want to call it. <laughs> And it's better to go make common cause with the far right um, rather than allowing sort of the radical left to, to gain power, right? And this is how far right movements get to power. They do not get 50% plus of the vote. That basically has never happened anywhere, right? Um, but if the center right, the, the moderate conservatives, right? right. If they decide to make common cause with the far right, then democracy might fall. That is when democracy has a problem. Can I ask you a quick question? One thing, and uh, Cliff, he and, uh, Thomas and I had talked about this over lunch, is you're describing how Germany sort of has these guardrails and Germany sort of aggressively defends its democracy because of your, you know, my generation would say recent history. Your, you know, your generation might say a little more further, but but relatively recent history. Yes. America doesn't have that kind of recent history. Uh, not only, okay, also we have the First Amendment and we have a different history in that regard, but also we don't have a recent history of fascism. We don't have any kind of genetic memory. Or at least of, on the national level. On the national level, we have no kind of genetic memory of that yeah. kind of thing. My mom doesn't, I don't, zero. I am brought up with nothing suggesting that this country was recently fascist and oh boy, we better be careful. And I worry that that's part of our problem in dealing with Trumpism and what's happening with the Republicans right now is you all know to be careful. We are getting worried, but we don't even it, it puts it puts the media at a disadvantage. It puts us all at a disadvantage. 
So let me let me push back against please yeah. the idea that what is happening now in America is something new, something Americans lack the experience to deal with, something of an aberration yeah, in, in, in US history. Now, so if at its core, what is happening right now is a white reactionary backlash as a result of uh, uh, reels of social and, and racial progress, right? If what we're looking at is white conservatives and the party that is entirely focused on their interests and sensibilities, the Republican Party, right. are basically being faced with the choice of either accepting those social, racial, uh, uh, that social and racial progress, accepting a truly multiracial, pluralistic democracy, and sort of the end of white Christian dominance in this country, or getting rid of democracy to entrench white Christian dominance. If that is what we're looking at, and I think that something is, that sounds very familiar to some things that happened in the past hundred years. Then, that's the thing. Then that is not new. That is what I would say is the norm or has been the norm for most of American history, right? It, again, it happened in reaction to the first experiment at multiracial or biracial, basically, democracy in the wake of the Civil War, which we call the Reconstruction period, right? Uh, when the violent backlash against that led to the establishment of an apartheid regime in the South, which is the Jim Crow South, yep. right? That lasted until well into the 1960s, which is not that recent, right? Uh, not that far away. That is right. more recent right. than Germany's experience with, with right. authoritarianism, right? It happened in the 1950s and 60s when, in reaction to the civil rights progress, the modern conservative movement formed, right? And soon became the dominant faction within the Republican Party. And it happened again in reaction to the first Black person being elected president in 2008, now, when you say what, yeah, but what about specifically an authoritarian regime, right? Authoritarianism. Well, look, the Jim Crow South was exactly that. It was a one party authoritarian regime established to uphold white supremacy. <clears throat> now, if you want experience in like what that looks like um, I, and, and what the threat is, right? What the authoritarian threat is that we're now dealing, I think we should look first and foremost to, again, what was the reality in a significant part of this country right. well into the 1960s? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, we were talking about this. We, have, we had a guest on earlier this week, David uh, Pepper, who wrote a book about what's going on in states around the country right. and yeah. how there's, there's a lack of democracy. Like a lot of states at this point, I live in Ohio here, you know, what the majority wants doesn't happen. Here. Yes. Yes. We, we are at this point, if anybody tried to argue that this is a functioning democracy, quite literally, it isn't. Um, yes. It doesn't matter. So, you know, when you look at what you're talking about, right, in these states where, you know, when we talk about this, you had black state legislators, members of Congress, governors, all through the, you know, the eight, late 1860s, um, the 1870s. I know you just got to sign up on the screen. That was weird. Um, and <laughs> sorry. <laughs> It's OK. And the um, and, you know, the 1880s is when this backlash started, a lot of it in the 1890s. Um, and then suddenly, you know, and, and this will be for the history geeks among us like me and uh, our professor here. You get the Dunning School of, of historians who look back and claim that the great lost cause and slavery was a beneficial program. And you get birth of a nation and you get Woodrow Wilson in office, right. quite frankly, who was a white supremacist southerner. Who would, you know, so yes, we didn't have authoritarianism on a national level, um, you know, and you didn't necessarily have it in the Northeast and other places. I, my family didn't grow up with any understanding of that, but it quite literally existed in the Southern states where, where people right. who had been elected to office, and David brought this up on our show, who were young black men or, you know, mostly it was men, it wasn't women, it wasn't full democracy, certainly. Yes, yes. Suddenly, there was no future for them. A lot of them moved north. Um, you had a great migration because of a lot of this to the north. I'll, I'll kick it back to our... our well, but, yeah, go on. Yeah. But did we... I mean, let me ask both of you, though, or maybe throw it to Thomas. But is that a, is that something we learned a lesson to? Did we deal with it effectively in the 1950s and 60s? I mean, look, no. You know? But the thing is... Um, it's that's an indictment of the American educational system. It's an indictment of the American political culture, right? Yeah. Um, it's an indictment. Of I can see American the comments right now. Damn foreigner, don't criticize America. 
<laughs> oh, I look, trust me, I get that a lot, right? Do you actually? <laughs> um, like, yeah. I, I get that a lot. I get a lot of like, oh, I'm I kidding, don't like course. it here. Why don't you go home? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. hey, look, here's the, here's, the, I want to make it. It's okay. John, John's gay and I'm Jewish. And so we're not allowed to talk about anything <laughs> important either. <laughs> none of us is, none of, neither of us is allowed to say any of this, right? right? Yeah. Um, no, but I, I want to make maybe a, a, a serious point about yeah, yeah. this t- type of critique that I'm getting, right? If you don't like it here, why don't you go home? Here's the thing. I like a lot of things about America, uh, about the American uh, promise, if you want, right? Because here's the thing. I'm not saying uh, America is like this this racist, this this terribly racist country and it will never change. I'm saying what we should grapple with. Now I say we, even though I'm not American, but whatever. What we should grapple with is that in this country, right from the start, um, there has been this struggle, this conflict over what America should be, right? Right. There is this idea, or there was this idea, um, it has always been part of the American political project that, you know, as it says in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. We would would say all people or all human beings are created equal, right? Which is, again, at the time, late 18th century, and a radical claim, that's a radical claim, and it's a radical promise, a radical promise, but, so that's that's one part, right? right. So basically, the, the promise is America should be a place where your status uh, as an individual should not be determined by race, gender, uh, religion, sexual orientation, whatever it might be. That's right. that's one part of the promise. But the the other part, the other part of that struggle, um, has always been no, 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 no. That's not what America should be. America should be first and foremost a nation of and for white Christians, right? It should be a place where white Christians and let's be honest, white Christian men get to dominate, get to define American (laughs) identity, get to define what is and what counts and what doesn't count as real America, right? And everyone else has to, you know, fall in line and either just shut up or leave, Which, Which I'll say quickly, and you can prove this, which is why the economic programs to bring about more equality were always fine in this country as long as they left black people out. Absolutely. Right? I mean, yes. FDR quite purposely, he, he sort of started with, a, he did a, a few, was he, was it him? I think he may have been the first one that required government contractors to, to uh, some government contractors to be minority companies. But for the most part, he stayed away from race because he knew that there was no way they were getting the economic programs through if it included uh, you know, African Americans, and then of course Truman desegregates the military and and starts heading in the in the direction of civil rights, and that's where it all starts. The Democratic Party starts its slow breakup. That's when what's his name, Strom Thurmond, runs an indep- as an independent in 1948, and I think you can really see that as the beginning of this new coalition of white conservatives. So FDR, it's a, it's horrible, it's a shame, but it was right. He was right, and they were right. So I think my perspective on the New Deal, by the way, is perhaps slightly more positive than that, because I think that the problem with the New Deal was not so much how it was conceived on the federal level, more how it was implemented on the state level. And again, that gets us into sort of the way it was implemented on in uh, southern in, states. In the South, right? It was implemented by these Dixocrats, so these, 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 these racist Democrats in the South. Again, one party rule, right? Um, and they, of course, implemented it in the most racist, sort of most discriminatory way possible. Um, but anyway, besides that the general point stands, right? So the, the, the big conflict <clears throat> in this country has always been, so is America, is it a, a nation of and for white Christians first and foremost, and everyone else has to shut up and fall in line? Or is it something else? Is it this truly multiracial pluralistic democracy? Now, again, both of these principles and both of the both of these political realities have always been part of the American political project right so I'm not saying like I'm not coming here and saying hey I'm here to tell you what a what a right. terrible country this is I'm here to tell you what we are experiencing right now is um a continuation of that struggle right. in American history right um and in a way this is sort of my if you want my glass half full uh, kind of reading of the situation right. even though look I am terribly concerned uh, about the, the prospects for American uh, democracy. Don't, don't get me wrong, but my, my kind of glass half full kind of reading of the situation is that 
what we're witnessing right now on the American right, this radicalization, this anti-democratic radicalization that we're witnessing right now is not coming from a place of strength. It's not coming from a sense of winning. It's coming from a place of weakness. The American right, and I think quite quite rightly so, quite, quite adequately so, is perceiving America to be changing away from sort of white Christian dominance right. towards something else, right? And I think right. that is correct for political reasons, for cultural reasons, for demographic reasons. Right. The country has become less sort of dominated by white Christianism. Sure. Right? I mean, you can even just see it in voting numbers. It's right there. Yes. Right. So right. I mean, Obama, like Obama became president with a, a clear minority of the white vote, right? I think right. when he was reelected in 2012, he got something a little over 40% of the, or maybe even a little, around 40% of the white vote, which is like back in like the 80s, that was completely unthinkable. Right. Someone becoming president, even though the clear- It was impossible, majority, yeah, the numbers weren't there. Right, exactly. So the country is changing in this direction towards the multiracialism, multi right. Thomas, let me ask cool. you, and I, I don't mean yes. to cut you off, but you're you're very, <laughs> you're so good, it's like hard to jump in. It's like, I'm like sitting in a history lecture loving this. Um, okay, but so what? And what I mean by that is, okay, you you made the point, which was interesting, that, uh, that sort of the reactionaries, the Trump, right, all this kind of stuff are not coming from a position of strength. They're coming from a position of perceived weakness. Yes. Um, so what does that mean for us? What does that mean we should, does that tell us something about how we should respond to them, how we beat them? I, I, I look, first of all, it tells us that um, in a way that makes it more dangerous, right? Ah, okay, way, that's what I was wondering, yeah. Right, because basically they are, like, if you pay attention to like what's going on on the right and how they define the situation, how they perceive the situation. It is basically, they feel their backs against the wall, right? Okay. It's this type of siege mentality that is dominating yeah. on the American right. And basically what they're saying is, look, we have to defend what they, again, define as real America, right? Which is right. white Christian America. We have to defend that by whatever means necessary. That's right. where sort of the radicalization comes from. That's where the sort of the, the, the willingness to go to extreme lengths, right? Um, that's where that comes from. Because again, look, if you truly believe that America is not changing, but real America is actually dying, right? If you if you only if you're only willing to imagine America as a place where white Christians dominate, right? And you perceive that to be like again it, under threat, under siege right. from sort of what they perceive as quote unquote radically un-American forces, right? right? Which is how they define the Democratic Party, right? Right. They don't see a political opponent. They see an enemy. They see a radically un-American enemy pursuing a radically un-American political project, right? Per, like a, a an un-American political project that wants to turn America from what it should be into what it should not be. If right. that is your perception, then you are willing to do some quite extreme stuff, right? right? And then you might not be willing to accept what this election result or that election result. No, like in the perception of a the American right, um, at least a uh, a very strong part of the American right, democratic governance is fundamental, like capital D democratic governance is fundamentally illegitimate and must yes. not be accepted. That is a major right? problem, yes. Right. And that's a big, right. big problem. That's a big problem. Right. So what I'm saying is not, hey, look, just relax. It's all good. Right? Cool, man. We just, got you know, this. Have a beer. We got this, right? right? So that's not what I'm saying. But but what I am saying is if this country, if America were a functioning democracy, by which I mean a system that placed by majorit majoritarian rules, a system in which if you get the majority of the people to vote for you, you get to say what's going to happen, right? Which is crazy. crazy. Yeah. So with your radical theory. <laughs> you goddamn German communist. <laughs> Look, I know it's it's the crazy it's the crazy left German in me that thinks democracy. Mark, right? I, I mean, Marx can't well, actually, Germany. I understand this now. You guys just right. sneak in here. I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. Actually, no. But Thomas, tell them. But explain to people what you told me about who set up your democracy. Oh yeah, I mean, look, that's that's sort of a funny thing, right? So, so, like, the U.S. since 1945 has, in several places around the world, including Germany, 
um, been involved in what we might call regime change, right? Yes. And in setting up democratic, democratic culture and institutions but, and, but, you know, Japan too. Obviously. Right. Yeah. Or like, yes, exactly. But, in, but, but good. I mean, regime change, you're joking because obviously good thing we did in Germany and Japan. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Look, I, look, I'm, I'm using... Yeah, it's a joke. But yeah, he's yeah. having fun. Yes, he's having fun. fun. Yeah. Um, I'm, not, I'm not endorsing the sort of, uh, the, the sort of neocon uh, George W. Bush version of that, right? But yeah. I'm saying the funny thing is, if you look at the type of democracy that was established in Germany, for instance, right? It's very, very different from the American political system, right? Um, the what was established in Germany after 1945 is not the type of democracy, the type of sort of presidential democracy that you have here. No, like we have a parliamentary system, right? Um, um, Which I find to be far superior. I'll say quickly in again, terms of representation the, the funny, of people. The yeah. funny thing is that apparently the Americans who were responsible right. for reestablishing German democracy also thought, hey, you know what? Let's, yeah. Let's not do exactly what we have. Exactly. We did. <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. They looked at what we had done and it's what crazy. didn't work and they were like, let's make a better one 160 years later. Yeah. Look, it's wild. To, tie this, to tie this back into what I said earlier, like the main conflict in this country always having been, right, what type of, is it a white Christian uh, country or is it something else? The way the American political system is set up, with all its sort of counter-majoritarian, anti-democratic features that it has, right? The Senate is, well, at best a non-democratic, but really an anti-democratic institution, right? Yep. The Electoral College, meaning the president is not, not directly elected yep. by the people, right? The Supreme Court being entirely removed from democratic control, right? So all the, you have all these sort of... Um, anti-democratic or non-democratic features of the American political system, that's not a coincidence. That's not an accident. Of course. That is specifically how it was set up. The American constitution in the late 1780s was specifically set up in this way to rein in what, again, Alexander Hamilton specifically called, and I quote, the excess of democracy, right? Huh? They were trying to push back to rein in too much democracy. The founders like if we want to talk about them, we're very much worried about too much democracy, right? So there has always been this struggle in this country that, that has defined the American political project. Like how much democracy- California do referenda. Right. Like, well, that's where that was one of the- But those were progressive reforms that yeah. were meant originally to give more democracy. And right. of course, now yes. they've been hijacked by major interests. Because the interesting thing about those early debates about democracy is- Let's face it. I mean, racism, a the, the bunch of the founders had slaves. I mean, a, a lot of it was based on racism, but some of it was also based on things that we'd recognize today, which is if you allow too much democracy, those who are not sort of educated in how democracy works, the mob, as they saw, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would, would, would come out and vote for any crazy thing you sold them. And they weren't so wrong about that, were they? Because we're seeing that today. That was well, their look, concern. Look, I think... So, so first off, that's not necessarily a, a something that is specific to America, right? So the fear of the masses, the irrational masses, they can so, so easily be seduced, right? That is something that dominates the, this, the international discourse over democracy, like well into the 20th century, right? So in the 1930s, for instance, in over in Europe, one reason why you had so few people standing up to defend democracy against, again, the onslaught from the radical right and from the radical left. So few people in the sort of democratic center standing up to, the, to defend democracy. One of the reasons was that most people were kind of skeptical about democracy, hmm. even like in the center, yeah. in the political center. And, and the main reason for that skepticism was that most people, at least sort of most elites, right, were very skeptical about giving too much say to the masses, right? The masses is the big, the big fear. Yeah, yeah. Even if you're like, again, you can look at like social democrats in 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 the 1940s. Even they like were talking about, oh, like maybe not let the masses have too much of of an influence here. But in the American uh, political tradition, right, this of course, has always come with sort of a, a racialized understanding of who those masses right. are. And of course, but also with a class element to right. it, right? And I think I mentioned this to you, John, when, when we like talked for 17 hours over lunch. Um, <laughs> there is this incredibly revealing moment in, um, in 1965 when William F. Buckley, 
who is the founder of the modern conservative movement, right? Right. The guy who still to this day conservatives, and we're not talking about Trumpists, we're talking about sort of the intellectual conservatives. Yes. Uh, the, the 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 moderate conservatives, the serious conservatives, right? The respect which there aren't a lot left of, sadly. But yes, well, those who call themselves that, right? Yes, um, <laughs> they look up to this guy, William F. Buckley, as sort of the founding father of their political project. He founded the National Review, which is to this day sort of the, the, the sort of the, the flagship of all these conservative uh, um, um, magazines and, and 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 newspapers. So this guy, William F. Buckley, he um he's invited. It, it's it's an Again, it's an incredible story. He's he's invited to the to Cambridge in England um, by the Cambridge Student Union to debate um, uh, James Baldwin, the the, the great uh, African American uh-huh. intellectual, um, over the question of uh, whether or not basically um, African Americans in in America should be allowed to vote, right? Um, 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 so they debate this question in front of this audience of, of English students, right? And so Baldwin speaks first and, 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 then, and then Buckley talks. And, and Buckley basically says, so he says, no, like, look, the problem is so complicated. Like, um, it's not that easy. Like, the problem in America is complicated. And then someone from the audience um, um, just, just shouts at him hey, why don't you just let black people vote? How about that? And he says, no, 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 no. I don't want black people to vote. Um, and then like, he's like, oh, that's racist. That's racist. And he says, no, it's not racist. I also don't want 65% of white people to vote. <laughs> he's like, at, least he was, at least he was being honest. <laughs> right. That's basically sort of, right. I'm classist. I'm not racist. <laughs> so the, the thing about Buckley's position is it's not just his position, right? That is sort of the, the, the central position uh, amongst sort of these, these, these leading conservative intellectuals in the mid 20th century right. is, look, there is too much democracy. The big fear, the big thing is, um, we can't have black people vote. Buckley himself wrote in 1957 a remarkable in, in the National Review. I read that, read yes, that piece. Exactly right. It is called. It's an. It's it's an op-ed, and it's called "Why the Self Must Prevail." Right. So this is this is after uh, Brown versus Board of Education. So after the civil, the, the Supreme Court ha- has decided, look. Uh, we need to stop with the segregation in the educational system. It's it's not constitutional. You have to you have to integrate the education system, right? And so Buckley says. Like explicitly, no, we can't look, we can't have this and we cannot let people in the South vote. Why can't we do this? Because there's too many of them. If we have democracy in the South, that means white Christian dominance. He calls it white Christian civilization, um, which is, again, he says is superior. White Christian civilization is superior. Yeah, he used to be able to say stuff like that openly in 1957. Yeah. Oh, he's, he did, right? He did. Yeah. And he says, look, that's the thing. Democracy is fine as long as it does not hmm. threaten white Christian dominance. But the second it does, democracy has to go, right? right? Because to him, democracy is not the principle. You know what it reminded me a lot of, I'll say? It reminds me a lot of? It reminds me a lot of today the, when you saw conservatives who would say, look, I don't like Trump. He's not great. You know, he's whatever. But if we have to choose him or those, you know, or, or versus the left, you know, to stop too much, they wouldn't say too much democracy, but to stop the radicals from changing our country, we have to. It sounded like that, like like he was almost at least at my memory of reading that piece is, you know, and he, he said the same thing, by the way, when McCarthyism was going on, yes. which was, yes, there are some yes. excesses here, but we have to choose between the mob yes. on the left and, and right. McCarthy. I choose McCarthy. And that's how he became famous, yeah. right? By defending yeah. McCarthy. He wrote a book where he defended McCarthy yep. and McCarthyism. You know, one, one yeah. quick point, too. What's interesting is what you're saying, and I'm not, again, I'm not sure how this influences how we respond to it, but right. when you look at all the Republican efforts to, well, A, to eliminate the vote, you know, to stop black people from voting, people from churches, things like this, you know, traditional, dem- or what they see as traditional Democratic blocs in that region, like the South, and B, to actually steal the election from us, like what they wanted to do in Arizona and Georgia, and they're planning yes. to do next time. Uh, the Democrat wins, Democratic president, and they have the legislature overrules it and says, no, you know, Trump really won, not Biden. You know, we we think of it as a pure steal. Like they just know they know we don't like black people. We're racist. We're not going to let them vote. But they, but a lot of them think of it as actually a legitimate, you know, jihad <laughs> in the right. sense that they're God's warriors. They right. are they are literally this is a good thing that we're stopping the heathens from voting. Like it's it's not just, hey, it benefits they, us. They see what the hell? system, which is what Thomas had said. Exactly. It's part of this larger uh 
uh, concept for them that's actually right. doing good. They're, and it's not doing good by any means necessary. It's no, no, no. We're actually doing good work here. We're not stealing the election. <laughs> We're saving the elections by only having the good people vote. I think we really need to, if we want to understand what's going on on the American right, right? And when I say the American right, I mean large parts of the Republican Party. I mean the right-wing militia movements. I mean sort of conservative intellectuals, right? So I, I mean all of that. Right. If we want to understand what is animating them, right? And what is animating them to support this like blatantly authoritarian onslaught on American democracy, right? We have to, I think we have to grapple with the fact that most of them really think they are fighting a noble war yeah. to preserve like real America, right? Yeah. Look, there's a lot of grifting going on. Absolutely, right? There's a lot of cynicism. Go absolutely, all of that. Yes, yeah. all of that. But what's at the core of it, right? It's like always. I, I always tell my students, like, ask yourselves, these people that we're looking at, what do they tell themselves in the morning when they look in the mirror? Mm. And very few people look in the mirror in the morning and go, "Well, I'm a cyn- I'm a cyn- I'm a cynical bastard, am I not?" Donald right? Donald <laughs> Trump does. No, but the irony is, Donald Trump looks in the mirror and goes, "Sucker." Yeah, bro. but also the. But wait, wait, but he's running a movement of true believers, which is what's fascinating. Also, but, the part that you missed is that when they look in the mirror in the morning, most of them have no reflection. Yeah. Sorry. I, Mary I had to make Mary a vampire Worth. joke somewhere. Go ahead. But again, this this I think really brings us because John, you said so, like what about Trump though, right? So because he openly says, Well, I I Well, he's the, the grifter system. in charge of a movement of believers, which is what fascinates me. I think but what is I mean, what I think is so interesting about so why did they why did they unite behind Trump, right? Why did they, why did they choose Trump? Why yeah. do they treat Trump like, oh, he's the chosen one? And I, I think, again, the key text to me that I, I, again, I want everyone to read and everyone to grapple with is this essay that came out shortly before the 2016 election. It was, it was, it came out in September, 2016. It was written by this guy, Michael Anton, who is, again, he, he wrote it for the Claremont Institute. Is this the uh, Flight 93? Exactly right. Yes. yes. So the Claremont Institute now a little more famous or infamous because John Eastman, the guy who wrote the legal <laughs> memo, right? Defending. Here's how you coo. Here's how you do a coup, right? And it's totally legal. Listen to me. I'm a constitutional uh, expert, right? This guy is also, that's Claremont Institute. It's basically the home base, the center of sort of the the most uh, most blatantly pro Trumpian uh, intellectual conservatives, right? right? So and, if you, and I'll uh, say quick. I just want to say yeah. in two seconds. I don't want to cut you off, but if you follow this stuff closely, you start seeing names again and yes. again. Mercatus Center yes. at, at George Mason University, Absolutely. and and actually the the George, the University of Chicago economics right. and. There are these places where if you know it, it almost it's like a Da Vinci code. You see these things like right, like Claremont, you know that it's right wing yes. funded, uh, you know, probably Koch brothers and, and Bradley and uh, whatever foundations and all this other stuff. So just for people that don't know, Absolutely. they've been a long time purveyor of right wing talking points. Go Absolutely. ahead. And, and what I think what makes the Claremont Institute so interesting is that these people are the ones that are articulating most clearly and most precisely why they are uniting behind Trump, right? So this Michael Anton guy in this essay, the flight 93 election, he calls it, right? So again, shortly before the 2016 election, he, um, he wants to, um, he wants to defend his choice to go with Trump, right? And he wants all the, all conservatives to unite behind Trump. Why is that, right? So he says that um, what we are facing in the 2016 election is not a normal election, right? But it's basically the choice between letting America die or like defending America if if necessary with your own life. That's why he refers to Flight 93. Right, you're, you're taking a chance. You still might crash, but it's better than letting the terrorism take place. And he kind says, of thing, right? we need to storm the cockpit, right? He's, yeah. that's, that's sort of his analogy. We need to storm the cockpit because these, again, these radically anti-American, yeah. radically sort of radical socialist anti-American forces led by this illegitimate democratic party, right? They, if they get the presidency, if they move into the White House, this is the last chance to stop this, right? Again, this is why why, why I say it's not yeah. coming from a sense of strength. It's coming from a siege mentality, right? Wait, Thomas, can, is, yeah, fin- right. finish saying what he's yeah, saying, yeah. then I got a so, question so about and it. He says, yeah. and, and the interesting thing that he says is, so we what we need right now in 2016 is someone who is willing to storm the cockpit 
and is someone who is not beholden to any rules of civility or any rules of like norms and being <laughs> nice and friendly. Or, or any rules of non-sociopathic behavior. Yeah. He says, he literally says in the, in the text, we need a bruiser. We need a brawler, right? And that's why he says, look, yes, he says, yes, Trump is despicable. But he turns this into, that's exactly why right. we need to unite right. behind him. We need someone like that right now. We need a bruiser, a brawler, someone who goes in, someone who just fights the fight, storms the cockpit for us, and again, right. stops it. Because this is our last, he literally says, it's our last <laughs> chance to stop this sort of un-American project, the death of real America. And I really right. think that gives you such a great window into sort of the the mindset that is animating most why, of these. Why is so, but why is so much of what they do projection? You know, I mean, so <laughs> much of what, they, but, I, I, but I'm quite, wait, Cliff, wait. You know, wait, ask wait, John, and I want to, I know, yeah. I'm saying ask, and then I want to yeah, say yeah. something. Because there's, there seem to be so, well, that other, other until you get to the bruiser, but so much of what they're claiming there is exactly what the Trump presidency, you know, threatened, right? And then we hear them talking about, I talk about the coup, or the coup, the insurrection and all of that all the time, you know, that if the insurgents were told the truth, if it was true, if it were true, that Amer that the American election was stolen, that Congress yeah. colluded with the Republicans and Democrats got together with the elites and decided we're not going to let the guy who won become president. We're going to pick a totally fake guy in a coup d'etat. If that were all true, I can understand why there's yeah. violence. Like, but they're, they take they don't just lie. They turn the story on its head. And I don't know if it's intentional or whether they're just, it's convenient, but they always accuse us of that of which they are doing. And I just don't know if that's a normal, if that's a fascist thing, if that's just convenience, I don't know what it is, but it's, yeah. I don't, I'll say quickly, say? I feel like, well, I feel like a lot of it to answer that. And I want Thomas obviously yeah. to give the more expert answer than mine, but is, you know, a lot of it is that they are doing these things because they assume they have to to hold on to, you know, their country. And right. because they're doing them, they assume we must be too. Ah, there you go. I dealt yeah. with this so much yeah. in the, you know, my work on, on gun control, which is that they just assume that I, of course, I, it had to be a liberal plot to come and hmm. take away all of their guns. So they would be weakened and we could win. It couldn't be that maybe like, I don't want right. kids to die needlessly in schools. Right. You know what I mean? And because of the way they would do it, right. which is in a very, I don't want to overuse the word authoritarian, but in a very right. kind of autocratic, very right. sort of demanding manner, well, we must be the same way. And treacherous, lying. Right. They, yeah. they, we, they, they'll do whatever yeah. it takes to win because they yeah. feel so threatened and their backs are against the wall, like right. Thomas was saying. So they right. assume that we must be the same. And that's at least always been my that's take. That's interesting. Right. I, I completely agree. I think mm -hmm. the... Um, the, in terms of the the projection element of this, I think it's 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 very interesting how apparently in the sort of white Christian nationalist mind, it's just unimaginable that if someone else were in charge of this country, they wouldn't treat minorities right. Which again, like white white conservatives see right. themselves as the right. minority, right? And they just, it seems unimaginable to them that right. someone else in charge wouldn't treat minorities the way they have always. The way them. they would, right. right? Um, so <laughs> I is, would screw you, so of course you'd screw me. There is a certain, there, yeah. is, there is an element of this. But yeah. I want to say something about sort of the, the, the conspiracy theory side of element of this, right? Because yeah. John, you said like, oh my God, they're, they're being fed these lies and these crazy conspiracy right. theories, right? I think... Um, What's so interesting about what's going on on the right is that, you know, some of these uh, conspiracy theories, they're not like, some of them are sort of, they don't all go together, right? Some of them right. contradict each other, right? right? So is it that the ballots were stolen or it's like Chinese fake ballots? Right. Or bamboo, like, bamboo. Yes, yes, yes. There are traces <laughs> of bamboo somewhere, right? Yeah. Or is it like, oh, so, so who stormed the Capitol? Is it some Antifa right. people or right. no, it was Patriots the FBI. doing the right thing right. or it right. didn't happen at all. So you, right. you have all these versions, right? It didn't happen at all. It was just tourists or it right. did happen. But it was it Antifa, like, it was the FBI. Yeah. Okay, but the yeah. interesting thing is, right? All these contradictions, all these specifics of like, okay, what type of conspiracy is, is going on here? That really doesn't matter. What matters is what I think we should we should, we should call sort of the the higher truth. Hmm. The higher truth behind all that, behind all these specifics, is 
that a fundamentally illegitimate political faction, the Democrats, who represent a fundamentally illegitimate political project, which is to turn America from what it has to be, what it is supposed to be, a white Christian dominated nation right. into a multiracial pluralistic nation. That cannot be allowed to happen, right. right? It cannot be allowed to happen. And the Democrats are not a legitimate sort of political force because not, not only because they're, pursu they're pursuing illegitimate goals, but also because their political power rests on the votes of people who shouldn't even be allowed to vote, right? It right. rests on a coalition that has uh, a lot of people in the, in it that aren't even real Americans, right? Do you so, see that in what Tucker Carlson will often say when he talks about us trying to import immigrants here so they can vote for us? Yes. It's that exact strain. Yes. And again, you see it most clearly articulated. I come back to the Claremont people. There was this unbelievable essay uh, wrote by a guy called Glenn Elmers, uh, again, Claremont affiliated, right. writing it for the Claremont Review, which is their sort of flagship uh, uh, publication, right? And he, it came out a few months ago, and he literally says, look, here's the thing. Everyone who voted for Biden should not even be considered American, right? He literally <laughs> says, if you voted for Biden, if you vote for the Democrats, right, that means you're voting for an un-American project, you're voting for an anti-American project, and that means you forfeit the right to be considered a, uh, a, a member of the body politic. Cockroaches. Right? No, I mean, look, yeah. you, you're yeah, that's joking. What, that was Rwanda. But that's what they did there. That's, it was cockroaches. Yeah. You're joking, but that's. I'm not joking. I'm saying dehumanize right? them. That's exactly it, what I'm saying. It's extremely yeah. dangerous, right? Once yeah. you start defining, like, yeah. who are the people who deserve yeah. the rights and protection of being a member of the body politic? Yeah. And who are the people who do not deserve that, right? Yeah. That's dangerous. And he yeah. says, and that's what makes this so radical, but I think so really instructive, right? And telling of, of how they see the situation. He really says, over half of the American people should not even be considered Americans, right? Because again, if you go, if you vote for this radically un-American project, and that's of course, if you believe that, right? If you believe that, it doesn't even matter like in, if they have in strictly numer in a strictly numerical right. sense, oh, they right. might've gotten more votes. It doesn't matter because those votes don't right. count the same as the votes that we have, quote unquote, we have on our side, right? right? If that is your perspective on things, who cares if it was Chinese fake ballots or it was anti, whatever. Right. It's, it's fill in the conspiracy theory because you've got your reasoning right. already and right. you just have to right. fill in. Yeah. All these conspiracy theories, they they register with people on the right because they seem to uh they 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 they, they are they make sense on the basis of sort of this higher truth which is democrats are illegitimate they must not be allowed to govern we are the real americans only right. we are the real americans only republicans only the republican party stands for real america and so we must not let the other side govern right and again whatever like Everything that goes against this sort of higher truth is rejected, but everything that um, that is that sort of seems to support that is accepted, even though some of them even they contradict each other. Right? Yes, yes, exactly right. So that's the filter through which it's all seen. I think so, and that is why, again, that is why you have these um, these like these radical extremists like Marjorie Taylor Greene in, in Congress, right? And I, I, I really do believe that there are a lot of Republican elected officials in Congress who are not super comfortable with her shtick, right? With her yep. sort of brand of radicalism, right? But the question always is, why does she not get in trouble within the Republican Party? Because at the end of the day, they all know, even though they are somewhat uncomfortable with her sort of crazy brand of extremism, right? When she, she serves their interests in right? the end. They know they are united behind what is basically right. the same political project, which is, again, to entrench the rule of white Christian conservatives, specifically wealthy white Christian conservative men, right? And to, preserve, to, to prevent this country from ever becoming a truly multiracial plur pluralistic democracy. And who cares if Marjorie Taylor Greene is going a little crazy when she like, has this uh this 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 thing where she did you see where she um she was blowing up a Prius right and 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 basically like threatening this is what's going right. to happen to my like democratic enemies right 
I truly believe there are a lot of people in Congress on the Republican side who are like, ooh, that's a little... Can crazy. I ask you a question? Yeah, go would ahead. Somebody, would somebody have been, like a politician, have been arrested in Germany for doing that? Um, so I, I don't know about arrested because, look, I don't want you to look at Germany as like, <clears throat> oh, like... No, I'm just wondering, you know, I, I, yeah. honestly, I'm not trying to... I, I really am just interested in how other democracies handle this. So we just had an interesting case in the run-up to the election. Again, we just had a general election just a few weeks ago. Um, and in the uh, in the run-up to the election, the election campaign, there was um a uh the 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 red the, the far right party, the AFD, um they they put up um some some signs that said um something about you know kill all the, the green party members or whatever Ooh. right um but not it was it was here's the thing it was it was formulated in a way that it was somewhat ambiguous right so right. the meaning are they really explicitly because again the explicit um the explicit call for violence against the political opponent is that's not permitted in germany right so that that would have gotten you in trouble whereas there is there's latitude if you can either say, oh, it's satire, that's one thing. Just kidding. Like, right. <laughs> Just so, kidding. So the law, like so so every judge is the law says you have to look at it and you have to take the least incriminating meaning of, of what you are. Interesting. Reading. So okay. if, there, if there is a way of reading this as right. Not a call for violence, then that has to be so okay. the, even though we all the think the presumption, we say the presumption in English. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, but the thing is, so the police uh, uh, um, at this specific district, they decided, uh, no, 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 we're not going to have this. They just took those those signs hmm. down. But then a judge said, nah, I think it was probably hmm. it was borderline, but it was okay. But what I'm saying is, hmm. in Germany, at least you get a debate over this, and you get a right. a, 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 a struggle over this, right? And the authorities, the police. Uh, right. the, the legal system, they will get active with this kind of stuff. So this, right. again, this this sort of this boundary is actively policed, right? That, that is basically mm. what and, and that is, and, and that's been kind of the point I've made on this podcast a lot and in other places is that for us, we just let that boundary, um, we've let it erode. Yeah. And and you pointed out, the, you know, what, what um, Buckley had to say. I mean, clearly, look, Reagan, when he was running in 1980, yes. went to Philadelphia, Mississippi, where the three civil rights workers had been killed. Jesse Helms took him there. It's not to say they weren't faints towards racism constantly. But the difference is, is there were certain boundaries that you couldn't go past. In ter- I mean, obviously, what happened on January 6th and yes. holding people accountable, you know, uh, they wouldn't accept anybody who had made white supremacist signs and these kinds of things in the Republican Party. They would distance themselves. Yes. And that's where I feel like our weakness in saying the first amendment you know allows you to say and get away with anything has where you guys don't have that um you have a first amendment not first amendment but you have free speech you have this but but those things that harm the body politic right. you've got much more strenuous laws so do the british for that matter with libel laws and those kinds of things so do canadians um you can tell by who has kicked fox news off the air or never allowed it on it's like just us in australia at this point i think suffering through you know and and i do feel like it's harder now that you've got the internet, you've got online sources or whatever, but we allow sources that have, that have claimed legitimacy, Fox News, to do this, to radicalize people in a way that would never happen yes. in these other countries. And to me, that is what tore down that boundary because, you know, these guys are scared of, of being challenged from the right. And they are because every night, Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram and these folks are, tell, are saying – they're, you know, if they're if they're moderate at all, are attacking them as liberal and saying, you know, uh, they're wimps. You need to challenge them in a primary. So, our information or disinformation atmosphere broke to me that boundary in the Republican Party and is constantly polluting it and making it so that they have to kiss up to Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert and these folks. And that's why I see us as in serious trouble. That's why I see us January sixth happening and the rest. Although I, w- I will say that, so you sometimes come across this idea that or many people seem to think that um, it, it's so the, the radicalization is uh, it comes from the sort of the media environment, right? It's Fox News radicalizing and, and whatever. And look, I'm I truly believe we are still underestimating how toxic um, and 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 how like how 
what the enormous uh, cost for American democracy is that that but by allowing something like Fox News to happen on a nightly basis. So I'm not defending Fox News at all, but it is interesting that um, there were moments over the past 10 years or so where um, the sort of the line coming down from the Republican establishment, the leaders in the Re Republican Party and Fox News were a sort of sort of more moderating in some sense. So interestingly, right in 20, was it 14, I think 13 or 14, there was a moment when um, the Republican Party was trying to get on board with uh, uh, immigration reform, right? Yep. And it's like Marco Rubio was advocating for yep. the Even Hannity came out That's for it. That's the thing. That Hannity came out for a yep. short moment and said, look, this is not amnesty. We need this, right? We need to reform right. the immigration. But here's the interesting thing. They got so much pushback from the base, from the Republican mm -hmm. base, right? So much pushback that within weeks or days, really, Hannity was back to saying, well, this is like, they're replacing the white race or whatever. So it's not just sort of Fox right. News radicalizing the base. It is. It truly is also what the there is a certain percentage of the American population, somewhere between yeah. twenty five to thirty five percent of the population. Who knows, right? That really are just all in, fully invested, yeah. like ideologically invested right. in a certain the base like, radicalizing Fox oh, News. And we've seen that even when you know, Trump talks about yeah, vaccines now, too. right? And he'll get right. he'll be booed, yes. right? Which yes. happened, yes. and we saw that yeah. after January sixth. Just let me finish this point, yeah. John. You can jump in. Which is after January sixth, where you know Fox was like, "Whoa!" and and Fox had a bunch of coverage and invited on Republicans, yeah. Meyer, and for, you know, and Mace at the time from South Carolina, and some of these members of Congress were like, "This is too far." Yes. They started disavowing Trump. Elaine Chao resigned from the from you know, and all these sorts of things. The problem is, is as you're saying, the cycle is, is at least it seems to me, and I could be wrong with this. They've already so radicalized these people with propaganda for years, coming in their books, coming on TV, coming online, that when they try to take a step back now, they've so brainwashed their own people already that now their own Frankenstein people. Frankenstein monster. Frankenstein yeah, monster they've created this yeah. monster that will then <clears throat> turn on them. Yeah, you know what it, I mean. It, it, and, it, yeah, I want to give a, another quick example, which is interesting. Uh, Thomas, I don't know if if you were ever familiar with Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> of course. Oh, there you go. Well, but he hasn't been on. He hasn't been on the air for years, though. That's why I wasn't. No, sure. but I feel like I, I feel like you know? I should not. I probably shouldn't be allowed to talk publicly publicly about no, America. That's good. But but again, <laughs> it, he has he's he sort of got him off the air years ago. But O'Reilly, yeah. back in the early two thousands, I used to go on his show a lot. He used to have me on as like the token gay guy, but he liked me. He, it was very strange. But um, so I'd go on and I would I would like work the guy. And he started agreeing with me more and more like we were doing this. Lots of different campaigns started to agree with me more and more. A friend of mine uh, ends up interviewing him for The Advocate, which which was sort of the, the big gay magazine at the time nationwide. And Michael calls me and I'm sort of giving him advice. I said, OK, here's my take on O'Reilly. You know, he's actually better than you think. Kind of work with him, woo him a little. Say, yeah, but what about this? He does the interview. And this is like 2004 or so. And O'Reilly tells him there was a big effort in Miami-Dade to do some swipe at gay parents or whatever. And O'Reilly oh, sure. comes out against it. He asks him about non-discrimination laws for employment. And O'Reilly goes, well, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. You shouldn't be discriminating against people in employment. And he asked him about gay marriage. And he goes, you know what? I couldn't care less either way. If you want to get married, knock your socks off. Oh, the religious right flips out. Literally within a few weeks, O'Reilly becomes a raging homophobe. He is doing like all the issues Cliff's talking about, immigration, and everything else. Any issue he can grab that he can go crazy on, he's going crazy. And from then on, every little, the little, not even scintilla, the 20% of Bill O'Reilly that you could kind of play with was gone, was right. gone. And it was the base or not even the base. It could, it could also have been the base elites. So the religious and right just elites, so you know, right? John, yeah. so that people would know that what you're saying is a theme. He also was on Fox, came out in favor of doing something about climate change. Oh, um, and he was in favor of uh, – yes, I remember this because I went on huh. the crazy show a few times too. And I also was you know, working on pro various projects. Yeah. He also came out in favor of an assault weapons ban. He had oh, wow. some – but, but that, the problem is, is that when these, when these folks at least have gotten so radicalized – is that if you try to moderate, and this is, includes Republican politicians, or like who came out after January 6th, you saw Kevin McCarthy came out and was like criticized Trump. The problem is it's not just that Trump attacks him. It's that there's always other groups that are willing to feed on their carcass. So the NRA 
comes out and, you know, and, and shows, shows a slight bit of moderation. Gun owners from America attacks them from the right to see right. their sellouts. Right. And, you know, if Fox does it, OAN and Newsmax right. say, see their sellouts. And the problem is, is they started this cycle where where they all want to keep the easy money coming in from the rooms. Right. And so they're not willing to stand up and say, we care. We stand for something. We're willing right. to lose some people. It We're sounds like us they, versus Joppo Cliff to a degree. No, right. It, it is that because we, they are willing yeah. to, you know, they, if they were willing to do that, yes, they would lose some people. And yes, as, as Thomas pointed out, they would be booed. You know, Sean Hannity would have people attacking him, right. but they probably would influence some people right. to moderate their stance. And they're just not willing to do that at the risk yeah. of losing viewers. Yeah. And again, That's I think point. that if you look at the main differences between the situation in, in Germany and the U.S., um, one of the main differences really is there is a strong elite consensus in Germany still hmm. that certain boundaries have to be respected. And look, <laughs> I think the difference is not. And I think there's what a lot of people have some of a, 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 a all too rosy, uh, uh, somewhat naive understanding of where the German people stand. Right. I don't think Germans on average, right, the German people, the German electorate is more on board with multiracialism and multi -plural, like a, a pluralistic society. I don't think so, right? So like from everything we know, right? Always remember the amount of demographic and cultural change that America has undergone over the past few decades is so dramatically uh, uh, different and more than what a, hmm. the German society has seen, right? I think any society ever, right? Yes. I'm so correct, if you, yeah. If you confront it, like my mom, <laughs> Right, hmm. with the same type of demographic and cultural change over in Germany that, again, this country has seen. Like, don't believe for a second that she would be all in, right? No, right. absolutely not. She would be scared. She would be frightened. She would be uh, uh, very receptive to uh, uh, someone saying, look, no, we, we will preserve this country as a white country. So what I'm saying is the difference is not on the level of the people are more open to pluralism and multiracialism. I don't think that's the difference. But one of the big differences is that in Germany, there's a strong uh, elite consensus. And when I say elite, I mean uh, political elite, but I also mean sort of the, the media elite, right? right. Um, a strong elite consensus that says, okay, we'll criticize the Green Party to some degree, right? Um, and we'll call them crazy lefty hippies and whatever. But if someone says we should kill them or if someone says they're now no longer members of the body politic, that goes too far, right? And we will enforce that line. And then you will see, again, you will see conservative newspapers in Germany, right? You will you will see them say, no, 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 we'll, we'll go this far, but we don't go further than that. And this is exactly what happened after the, the last election, right? So the conservative party... Um, um, had its worst uh, election result ever in its entire history, right? They're losing, they're, they're going to lose power. It's not entirely clear yet, but we will get a coalition government led by the Social Democrats who, who form a coalition with the Green Party and what we call the Liberal Party. It's more of a neoliberal party, but whatever. But in any way, it's a center-left uh, new mm -hmm. government that we're getting. And you don't see anyone, anyone at least sort of quote unquote respectable uh, uh, on, in the conservative party saying, oh, that's an illegitimate government. Like we can't have this. We can't let them go. That's not what's happening. Everyone's like, okay, I guess that's what we're going to have to deal with now. Because what's they the potential for that? But what's the, because I think a lot of what we're seeing, whether it's intentional or by osmosis is some of the radicalism we're seeing in America now is happening abroad. And the question is, kind of why you think these things happen, because, you know, you look at the 1960s student movements and all of that. I wonder whether these things just with the way media is now, and by media, I also mean medium, such as, you know, right. Facebook and the internet and everything else, right. that these movements spread. But I also worry that people like Steve Bannon and others are exporting American extremism now to Europe. And um, to, that guy at the Kremlin, too, is probably worth The guy at the Kremlin. Office. I mean, to what degree is, and your fucking previous chancellor, whoever the fuck, who is it, Schroeder? Who's the one who's like the big Kremlin big lover Putin, now? Putinite. One of them sold out. Was it, was it yeah, Garrett Schroeder? Garrett Schroeder is now. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's oh. making good money now. Uh, he's he's making, the new Steven Seagal. <laughs> he's making good money now, repping yeah. sort of the, the Russian gas industry. Yes. Yeah. So, no, but I mean, but to what degree yeah. is Germany or any other country vulnerable to this kind of extremism being exported oh. to you? Yeah, I mean, look, it is, it is very vulnerable uh, because I think we're all facing all Western, quote unquote, Western societies right. are facing the same challenge. We are facing demographic 
cultural, political changes right. that make our countries less white, less Christian, right? More pluralistic, more multiracial. And we're all facing the same challenge. And I, I think the, the, the basic challenge is, is it possible to establish a stable multiracial pluralistic democracy, by which I mean a, a political, social, and cultural order in which the individual status in the society and in, 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 in sort of in politics this is not determined, again, by race, gender, sexual orientation, or religion. Is it possible to establish such an order or is are sort of the forces of backlash against that too strong to, to establish that? Because again, here's the thing. I think such a truly multiracial pluralistic democracy would be a world historic first. It just has never happened anywhere. Right. It has not been established anywhere in the world. Yeah. There right. are truly <clears throat> like liberal a stable democracies, think Sweden, like the Scandinavian countries. But look, those are those are not multiracial pluralistic. Yeah. Ideas, and in right? fact, when they've had anti-immigration parties, when immigration exactly. started to come there. Exactly right. So, again, I think what is so important about America, and that is why every far-right movement across the globe is paying very close attention to what is happening right. in America. And it's also why all these far-right movements across the globe were so like enthusiastic about Trump, right? right. Because they thought, look, this is proof. Trump's election is proof right. that this whole multiracial pluralistic democracy thing, it doesn't work. Right. It can't work. It can't be stable. It cannot, it cannot be. We told you it can't work. Right. Here's the proof. And this guy finally is going to stem the tide of this right. crazy multiracial pluralistic onslaught, right? right? That's why they were so enthusiastic about Trump. Because I think the, the right, the far right, is actually in a way better at sort of uh, 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 at analyzing what's at stake. They understand very clearly, right, very clearly, that what's at stake in America right now is the question of whether or not, for the first time in world history, we will prove that it is possible to establish a stable multiracial pluralistic, truly multiracial pluralistic democracy. Is that possible? Yes or no. That is a question of world historic significance, right? And that is why everyone is paying so close attention to right. it, right? That, those are the stakes. The stakes are really, really yeah. high. Let me, I, I, I mean, this is a good point to wrap anyway. We've gone about an hour, which is great. I, I wanted to ask you something sort of at the beginning that you had mentioned just to kind of explain, and you don't necessarily have to give the, you know, family dynamics of it, but more just the system in Germany. And this is one of the things that I think as an American, I'm very proud of what we've got. And I think people who have not, uh, you know, lived abroad, studied abroad, Cliff, Cliff, Cliff and I have both studied abroad, um, don't fully appreciate. And this is where I say we have more freedoms in a way, in some ways than people have in Europe and elsewhere. There is, um, tell people how it at least when you were growing up and you're not that old, <laughs> it wasn't that long ago, and whether that system still exists of how you had to pick what high school and what it meant oh, at yeah, what age. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that, that system does no longer exist, um, but it, it was, so the system used to be, you go to elementary school um, for four years, right? right? But then after your fourth grade. And um, which is what, 10, are you 10 years old now, nine years old? Or about... 11? 11, maybe. Okay, 10, 11 years old. 11, right? So you're okay. very young, right? You're very, very young. But then a, the teacher, your elementary teacher, gives you a recommendation um, to go to one of three different uh, 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 types of schools, right. right? We have three different types of high schools, basically. Only right. one, which we call gymnasium, um, right. qualifies you to go on to college, Right. Then right. there's one in the middle, we call it Realschule, right? right? Which was supposed to qualify you to do like you become an electrician or whatever, right? Right. right. And then there was sort of the, the third strand, which we called Hauptschule, which was only eight years total, right? Only eight years total of, of school education. Oh, you mean like you stop at age 13 or something? Grade or whatever. 14. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. So you stop at age like 14 right. and you become maybe a construction worker or whatever, right? You um, work for the electrician. <laughs> maybe. <if you're laughs> right. 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 So again, um, as I mean, as wow. you can imagine, like it was not easy. Like once you were on one of those trains, right. 
it was not easy to change and go like, oh, well, whatever, let's like start here. And then maybe you can change to gymnasium and, and, right. and qualify for college. It was not easy. Once you were on one of those right. tracks, you were pretty much stuck. How is it chosen that you're, you, did you get to choose or they kind of recommend yeah, to you? That's the thing. The teacher, like, again, so right until, so for me, that time came in 1993. I left elementary school in 1993. And I think, at that point, my parents could already choose themselves where to send mm. me. But shortly before, I think maybe the year before or two years prior, up until mm. that point, so up until the early 90s, it was still entirely up to the elementary teacher. One person. At said, age 11. That's what blows 11, my mind. I am going to, and I mean, as you can imagine, 11. like the decision, like the stuff that goes into that, decision, there's a lot of, oh, look. I mean, but whether you go to college, it's cra- at no, age 10. Your entire life. Right? Your well, entire well, life is being decided by a school teacher or yes. your parents, frankly, but at age 10. And just for this some kid's context gonna go to- for this, like the oh, British God. system isn't, I don't think, quite that way. But I studied in England. There's A levels, and whether you take them or not, which is sort of moving right. on to to university. Right. And you know, they're there you had to pick very young what you did, and often people were advised to not take their A levels to France to college. Cliff. France to Cliff, because I know first uh, Cliff speaks French and knows a lot about France, uh, like I do. Yep. In France. I don't know about now, but I know up until recently, there were different kind of lycées, the high schools you could go right. to. And there was like the technical lycée. There was the basically, you know, business lycée, but it, it they were already getting tracked. In their case, I don't know. Well, I'm sure there was a class level to it as well, but there was also yeah. a specialty yeah. level. But imagine at age 13 or 14, you're having to pick your specialty and you're lo- like the sciences and you're locked in. And I will say, and the and the internet may be changing that, but Americans, we have always had a much greater ability to do the gig economy. The gig economy didn't just right. start with millennials. You know, my generation, we're able to kind of switch and mix and match. And I remember Europeans saying, like, you got a law degree, but now you do internet? How the hell do they let you do that? And I'm like, oh, yeah. Look, I, I no. will say this. Yes. America. America, yes. <laughs> Fuck American yeah. Society, American society has traditionally had a lot more social mobility than certain European societies, but but with one big caveat for white people. For white people, right? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, for yeah. White people, yeah. because the level of social <laughs> mobility that you describe, and yeah. that I guess we would all aspire to, right? Um, it, it's not been the reality for yeah, people yeah, yeah. Who happen to not be white. No, fair point. Yep. Um, that is, I mean, that is so. That's a, that's a great point. That yeah, is only, so in, only in sports and things like that. Otherwise, right, right, exactly. Right. Yeah. But that is so telling and so important about. American oh, sports society. and sports, sorry, but Cliff and sports because there's a monetary incentive. That's what I'm saying. We're, we're getting rich off the black the, people. Right? We're making I mean, the big money off of it. And yeah, they're like, okay, for money, I'll accept the blacks. Right. Well, no, yeah. and entertainers. If you're a jazz entertainer yeah. and you're right. African American, if somebody yeah. is going to be able to, to be your agent and make money off of that, go for right. it. Right. But I think that's what's so telling about American society, right? So if hmm. you only look at white America, right? Look, with all the class differences and social inequalities that are still present even among white people, of course, right? Of course, not an egalitarian society by any stretch of the imagination. But if you just look at white America, this has been a fairly well-functioning democracy with quite quite a bit of social mobility for, for a long time, if you only look at white right. America. Right. right. But what it's never been is a society that extended that promise of democracy right. and social mobility to people who are not white, right? right? And again, the challenge really is, is it possible to extend that promise, including, again, welfare state protections, for instance, right? Is it possible to extend that beyond white America and still come up with a stable democratic system? Right. Or do you get too much of a pushback against that because too many people don't want that and right. you don't get a stable system? And here's the thing. It's an open question. We don't know yet. It's an open question. At this point, we must say this could go either way. And the people who still think in the year 2021, with all that we've been through, who still sit here and say, it's not going to happen here. I don't know what to tell these people. It absolutely could happen here because it absolutely did happen in this country. It was the historical norm in this country for most of its history. What couldn't happen? What couldn't happen here, they're saying? Well, like a sort of a sort of authoritarian, authoritarianism. Right. right the authoritarian... Oh, uh, the downfall of democracy, yeah. the authoritarian yeah. rise, and, and whatever. It, it, it's not going to happen here. Yeah. Right? It absolutely can because it absolutely right. did. Um, and there's absolutely no reason to think it, right. it couldn't. Right? <clears throat> get rid of this 
weird, naive, or willfully naive sort of American exceptionalism, right? Where everything's going to turn out awesome and America is a great democracy and the land of liberty and freedom. There is this promise of America exists and it's always existed, but that's exactly the challenge, extending that promise to people. Right, yeah. who or, well, or in this case, reversing it, because I got news for you. Yes. This fascism is coming for white people, too. This isn't just a racial issue in that regard. They're going to fuck us. I mean, I'm just saying, like, it's 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 fucking everybody. <laughs> As you said, but they don't, think, consider, they don't even consider us. Some, oh, no, I know what well, you mean. I'm, I'm, is, I'm expanding is, is the argument. That motivates people. No, no. I, that is I, still the... I'm not disagreeing. I understand his argument. I'm just saying that from a larger perspective, too, this is a white people. Thomas, this is getting into a discussion Cliff and I have about Democrats overall and how and frankly, God damn, you know, the fucking outlines of the damn infrastructure bill came out this morning, Cliff. And once again, I'm like, well, I'm not poor and I don't have kids. So fuck me. <laughs> There's just whatever. That's it. That's my own tangent about the Democratic Party, about our messaging. But that's my point is on a messaging level, too. This is a threat to everybody because they consider half the country un-American. Doesn't even matter. If you're black, you're even worse. But white people, too. I voted for Biden. I'm not American either, according to these guys. So I think you know. maybe maybe because um, you, early on you said, so what can be done about this? Yeah. Right? So it weighs out. I think... I think one thing, because you mentioned the Democratic Party and your frustrations with the Democratic Party, and yep. goodness me, I share many of those frustrations. Mm -hmm. But I think right now, what I think all uh, Democrats in this country, and I mean small d Democrats in this right. country, people who prefer to live in a system that is democratic, right? <laughs> <People who> think, <laughs> Which is hopefully still a majority of us. <laughs> right, exactly right. Mm -hmm. People who think, look, I believe in equality and uh, I believe that democracy is the political form that is best suited to guaranteeing uh, not just equality, but guaranteeing that everyone is respected and gets the level of dignity that they deserve as human beings. If we, the people who believe that, right? Again, small d Democrats. In this situation right now in America, you have to be a single issue voter. It has to be democracy, yes or no. It cannot be, oh, I'm so frustrated with Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, I'm not gonna go vote. Like, as of right now, I really don't care if you are, like, a fan of Nancy Pelosi. I'm not. Who cares? As of right now, we are faced with a choice between one party that is sort of, at least broadly speaking, on board with democracy, right? And one party that is blatantly not, that is openly telling us, no, we are not on board with multiracial pluralistic democracy, and we will do whatever it takes to prevent America from ever becoming that. That's the choice right now. Yeah. And if that's the choice, if that's the choice, look, then I, look, I have many problems with people sort of on the center right who call themselves never Trumpers, Bill Kristol, David Frum, Max Boot, many problems with many of their policy positions. But as of right now, they are... They are true to their word. They are anti-Trump. They're not going to vote for Republicans until the situation is different, right? They say, so for now, we have to vote for Democrats. So for now, I'm in the same camp with these people, right? As in, I mean, we've, we've had them on. Everybody, you, well, not Bill Crystal, but we've had them do right. from on here. And, and I've been attached for this on the left. John has been in whatever. Oh, of course. But, of course. but we've, our, our whole thing has been, are you insane? Like right now, anybody, I don't care what, Liz Cheney, my God. Liz Cheney, ever think, good. Ever think that she'd be yeah. an ally in any way. But right now, if you were defending democracy, you were my friend. We can fight about other things later. I will say that, like, I will say that I, I, I do not want to let these people off the hook for their for the role they have played in getting the Republican Party to the point where Trump right. became the Yes, but I still feel like we can talk about that later. Absolutely. Or right. or we can talk about it, but still realize that that doesn't mean that's right. the enemy, right? Like as of right now, Bill Crystal, even though I have, again... <laughs> Bill Crystal was horrible. Yes, he, I have lots of problems with Bill Crystal. <laughs> he's one of the masterminds behind yeah. Sarah Palin, right? Which is uh, an interesting step in sort of yeah. the progression. Towards Sarah Palin and also, yeah. he's one of the masterminds uh, behind defeating Clinton's health care bill because right. it was a lot of that Buckley-esque argument, which is like, yeah. yeah, well, it'd be great for people to have health care, but yeah. we need the Democrats to lose because if they lose, we win. Yeah. It's exactly. all pure political. So, yeah, Totally. I'm not, look, I'm not, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very certain that I disagree with most of their policy positions, but they are saying that they do want to defend American democracy. Right. And as of right now, that's the central fault line. And that's, that's how we need to make our sort of Exactly. Right. I could not agree more. With that. So it's a good thing that Democrats are talking about democracy every day rather than just childcare. I mean, look, it's I just hope, look, 
we need legislation, of course. We need legislation to protect the right to vote, to sort of fundamentally dem democratize the system. But we also need a change in political culture in this country, right? We need to get to a place where, again, small d Democrats in this country accept democracy as a communal project and responsibility, right? right. Yeah. It's something that we all have to, if push comes to shove, we have to defend it, right? And I'm not saying like grab like a weapon and whatever, but I'm saying like, go vote, I'm saying go protest, I'm saying like uh, 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 follow politics, like I'm saying be active, right? Um, but it has to be it has to be democracy as a communal project and responsibility. And that cannot always just fall to the traditionally marginalized groups. We cannot always just let, because like black women in this country or like black people in general, black women in particular, or um, or gay people or who, whoever, it, like whoever it may be, they have almost always accepted that responsibility to see democracy as a communal responsibility. White people usually have not, right? Because again, for most white people, it has been a fairly democratic country for most Right, of it was never a question. Right? Yeah. But again, at this point in America's history, it is up to every small D Democrat in the country to, to accept that responsibility. Um, and again, because this could really go wrong. It could really go right. wrong. And, and not in like 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. Like Depending two. on how the midterm elections turn out next year, we right. might be looking at a situation where it just gets very, very difficult to stop America's slide towards authoritarianism through elections. As of right now, I think we still can. We still can, through elections, stop America's slide hmm. towards authoritarianism, but we will not get a lot of uh, chances. Uh, so it's really like, there's a lot at stake and it, we need to like mobilize a certain sense of urgency yep. and, and to accept that this is not a situation where you can lay back and, and, right. and let whatever frustrations you have with the Democratic Party override your, uh, make, make your voting choice for you. This is not yep. that situation. Okay. I think that's a good place to wrap. I'm did, I you think any, so. did you have anything final or no? No, that's perfect. Okay. Thomas, thank you. Um, just Thanks to remind so much. folks, Thomas Zimmer, Professor Georgetown. Thank you. Very um, much. People can find you on Twitter. Are you active on Twitter much? Very active on Twitter. Ah, okay. <laughs> then what uh, is it just Tom? I don't remember. Is it just Thomas Zimmer or what are you on Twitter? Uh, it is a T Zimmer underscore history. Ooh. Okay. So it's yeah. It's Underscore. Oh. At, at, well, you know. I guess there's a lot of Zimmers around, is my it's guess. It's a fairly yeah. common name in Germany. So with with that name, yeah. It's, it's, but yeah, no, it's it's at t zimmer underscore history on Twitter. Okay. I'm very active on Twitter. Um, there you go. Much more active than I should be. Yeah, but I see this. Again, Aren't we all? I see this as part of my yeah. Uh, sort of, I don't know, like look, educating. I'm, I'm a historian, so whatever I can offer in terms of maybe yep. helping people to make sense of the situation, to yep. clarify the stakes, right? To sort of share my diagnosis of the political situation, I, I try to do that. And I think Twitter is actually a pretty good way to do yep. that. Right? So yeah. I try to do that. Yep. It used to be very Nazi for five years ago. Now they, they cleaned it up well. Were you, were you on Twitter in 2016? Yes. Oh, my God. I mean, oh, my it, God. It they're but kind of amazing. There, but it's, it's better now. Oh, no, but Cliff, amazing what they did, though, because 15 yes. and 16, they wouldn't touch them. And it was all no. either Nazis or Nazi wannabes, like kids being cute and, and ah, we're going to go after Jews and blacks and women and send them pictures of Auschwitz ovens. Ha ha. And all of a sudden, finally, it disappeared. And now they're all on Facebook and everywhere else. So go Twitter. Ironic. Yeah. Who knew? Who knew Twitter would be the least cesspooly? The responsible of, of the social media platforms. Yeah. 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 Facebook. Whoosh. We'll talk about Facebook another episode about how they're destroying democracy. Yeah. You know. All right. I'm sure, I'm sure many episodes, actually. But um, thank yeah. you so much, Thomas. Really Thanks, guys. Time. All right. It was a real pleasure. Thank you very much.